Claudia Volce, welcome to today's talk by Susan Mackay, which is part of this year's special online virtual failure brought to you by Phelan Fobel in partnership with St. Mary's University College and the Irish News. It's a great pleasure to welcome you, Susan, to this year's failure. Um, and to let our audience know, Susan is writing a book about borders for which you received an Arts Council of Northern Ireland Major Individual Artist Award and a grant from the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust earlier this year. It will be called Outside in the Navy Dark from a poem by Leontia Flynn. Her new book on Northern Protestants will be published early in 2021 when her landmark Northern Protestants and Unsettled People, first published 20 years ago in 2000, will also be reissued by Blackstaff. Susan is also working on a series of TV documentaries with Fine Point Films. So Susan, thank you for being with us and over to you. Thank you, Joanna. When James Heaney moved with his family from Belfast to Wicklow in the 1970s, he described himself as an inner emigre and a wood kern escaped from the fray. He'd crossed the border. In 1987, he published his collection, The Hall Lantern, and I'm going to read you a poem from it called Parable Island. Like so many Heaney poems, it may be about Ireland and it may not, but those of us who are from this country will always give it the local interrogation anyway, before considering that it might have wider meanings. So this is Parable Island. Although they are an occupied nation and their only border is an inland one, they yield to nobody in their belief that their country is an island. Somewhere in the far north, in a region every native thinks of as the coast, there lies the mountain of the shifting names. The occupiers call it Cape Basalt, the sun's headstone, say farmers in the east. Drunken Westerners call it the orphan's tit. To find out where he stands, the traveler has to keep listening since there is no map which draws the line he knows he must have crossed. So as Joanna has said, I'm writing two books at the moment. Uh, one is The Return to Northern Protestants and Unsettled People, and the other is Outside in the Navy Dark, and that's a book about borders. And um, I was going to actually write a book about the border, meaning our border, the border across this island, but then I realized two things. First of all, almost everyone is writing about a book about the border, and if they're not, they're making a documentary about it. They may well be doing both. They may well already have done both because there's a lot of new books out about the border and documentaries about the border and podcasts about the border. The border used for the most part to be a tranquil sort of zone. These days you can't cross the street or a boreen anywhere within miles or kilometers without getting asked whether you're Sorry, I'll just do that sentence again. The border used for the most part to be a tranquil sort of zone. These days you can't cross the street or a boreen anywhere within miles or kilometers of it without getting asked what you're going to do about Brexit. Secondly, I realized that what I really want to explore are other borders, including the ones that aren't necessarily marked on maps, but which nevertheless delineate us, us as insiders or outsiders. Borders to do with gender, race, class, identity. Some people move across and back freely. Others are refused entry. Some are banished. Some go on the run. Some perish. There are 25 million refugees attempting to move across borders around the world today. A few years ago on a holiday in a Greek island, I was sitting with my family in a delightful little rooftop bar looking out across the sunny harbour when I noticed a queue of people on the steps of the building next door. They were dark skinned, not Greek, not tourists. The women wore headscarves and long skirts. They looked weary. I realized they must be migrants in from the sea and lining up at the police station to enter into the asylum process. On another lovely family holiday in Sicily, I had a horrible feeling of unease while otherwise enjoying days on the beach the dread that the body of a dead African would wash up in on the tide. I saw a photograph recently taken in Italy. It was an installation, but it was also a real photograph. It showed a tall stack of rucksacks and duffel bags and supermarkets tied up with rope. They had all been taken in from the Mediterranean. Their owners had drowned. They too had been migrants attempting to enter Europe by boat. 
a ship's captain from Germany, Carola Raketa, was arrested for rescuing 40 African migrants and breaking through a naval blockade to land them on the Italian island of Lampedusa. The Italian interior minister, Matteo Salvini, called her an outlaw and the boat a pirate ship. There are lines we cross and lines we can't or won't cross. There are lines we are urged to draw in the sand. The Attorney General of Northern Ireland urged us to put one of those between us and the past, meaning the past 50 years of politically motivated murders. There is the border between the living and the dead, one with which we have all been forced to become preoccupied in this time of pandemic. Then again, there is the border for those who spent the last four months baking and those struggling on the medical front line to save the lives of patients whose blood was thickening to sludge while their, while their lungs turned solid. For those they could not save, these workers had to stand in for families and for priests or ministers, kind strangers saying goodbye as their patients crossed the borderline into death. And so I changed direction with my book. The border, our border, the border across this island will be part of it, but, but it will also stray into other border zones, other mountains of the shifting names. I'm going to read you a couple of short pieces which relate to the Irish border, though I know that even to call it this is to set foot on the mountain of the shifting names. This one dates back to 1999 and was my contribution to a book called The Border, Personal Reflections from Ireland, North and South, edited by Paddy Logue. I come from a border city that doesn't even have a name. Not a name that all of us can say anyway. Derry, Londonderry. Derry, where some of us live, shadows Londonderry, where the rest of us live. And Londonderry likewise hovers over Derry. The town is in a state that has no name, no name that all of us can agree, that is, but it has a shape, a child's comfort blanket shape with a raggedy hole called Loch Ney in the middle. We can all hug it and bawl. You can see the shape on the weather maps. It will be raining on our small island. Our southern coast has little headlands and inlets, and it's only when you try to go there that you find there is no sea, just another field and another on beyond that. It isn't an island after all. But the border is there all right, an invisible crack jittering across the country, 300 miles long and no one knows how deep. Border people are watchful. At the same time, they are experts at turning the blind eye. Their talk tends to be evasive. The border turns you into what you are, a Protestant, a Catholic, a soldier of one kind or another, a stranger. Best stick to your own kind, if you have any. Along its loneliest stretches, you feel you're being watched. British Army watchtowers, camouflaged like monster beetles, are vacant now. But you wouldn't be surprised late at night if the barrier slowly lowered and the red lights flashed. The dragon's teeth have been pulled or tipped to the side on roads that had quietly gone to meadow sweet and grass in the years they were closed. Stone arches of old bridges bombed in the 1970s have been left to decline gracefully, recently replaced by efficient concrete. Brash new EU highways find their ways into little towns in the Republic that seem to have been asleep since the 1950s. Bars with wooden counters and shoes for sale, potholes on Main Street. A Fermanagh man was asked in Cavan, was he from Scotland? Border towns have a restless feel. The frontier won't settle. Nationalists don't want it to. Derry is pushing towards the hills of Donegal. Dundalk waits its moment to move back north. The air is thin in the places that used when there were customs posts to be called no man's land. A certain sort of establishment flourishes. Bars that fill, feel that last ditch saloons, their customers alert for the moment when the doors swing inwards. Lurid pink hotels with parking lots for a thousand trucks. Fortunes are made and lost. A big house rears up behind and beside an imposing red brick garage, but before it's finished, the cars start going the other way to some man with a tank of diesel and a hand-painted sign on the other side. Punts and pounds. Much furtive business is done in laybys, watched by grey-eyed sheep and cows in trailers. The animals, according to the painter Dermot Seymour, know that there is no such thing as history here. Whatever that is, it is mysterious, our border. There are fields abandoned by Protestant farmers, too scared by the IRA to stay, too bitter to let the land, bad to let, to let go the land, sorry. There are fields abandoned by Protestant farmers, too scared by the IRA to stay, too bitter to let go the land. 
badlands where strenuous ragworts boast its yellow victory. Patrick Kavanagh's black hills look north at them, unapproved roads where bodies were dumped. Sometimes a rosebush marks the spot, often not. There are nationalist towns, sorry, there are nationalist towns stranded on the wrong side when the border was drawn around them, sullen and failing to thrive in a unionist state whose leaders said the Catholic people were disloyal. Paisley's deputy paced the border with a me measuring tape ready to cost a Chinese wall. We will never exchange the blue skies of Ulster for the grey skies of an Irish Republic. Loyalist graffiti. In Pettigo, the statue of an IRA man points his gun across the Terman River into Tully Homan. Pettigo is in Donegal in the Republic and Tully Homan is in Fermanagh in the north. Before partition, the two villages were one. The poet Porig Fiat wrote, these civil wars are only ever over on paper. Of course, most people just go about their business, as we say, passing no remarks. And in the towns and villages all along the border, the hanging baskets full of peace and reconciliation flowers look nice, swinging in the wind that blows both ways. So that piece was written just a year after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and this next piece is an edited version of a column that I wrote for the Irish Times in 2017, a year after the Brexit referendum. So a clever Channel 4 report has shown that the Brit on the street can't draw the Irish border. Some of them imagine an, some, sorry, let me start that again. So a clever Channel 4 report has shown that the Brit on the street can't draw the Irish border. Some of them imagining it as a loose girdle draped across the waist of the island, rather than as the noose around its neck, which it more accurately resembles. Easy to scoff, but plenty of citizens in the Irish Republic are disinterested, ignorant, or even hostile when it comes to the jurisdiction that lies beyond the border, that born depicted by unionists with a mix of sentimentality and defensiveness as our wee country. In Dublin, the case is extreme. Eyes have long since glazed over when the North is mentioned. Belfast is well beyond the pale. During the Troubles, anywhere north of Drogheda was for some up in the direction and to be avoided. But even now, even along the southern fringes of the border, a certain silence about it prevails, though thousands cross it every day. Right now, worried shopkeepers watch cars speed by as shoppers take advantage of the favourable exchange rate and head across to, across to Derry, Newry and Enniskillen. A week ago, I walked the beach at Mullochmore in County Sligo. An elderly man came down through the sandhills and set off towards the harbour. He had his hands clasped behind his back, holding a transistor radio, engrossed in listening to a discussion about Brexit on the border. It struck me that apart from anti-Brexit campaigners, he was one of the few people I have met since I came to work in this border region of the Northwest a year and a half ago, who appeared deeply interested in the issue, any issue about the North actually. I said this to a friend from the area. She said people might have their own thoughts, but might not want to risk provoking a northerner by airing them in front of me. Maybe. The last time I lived in Sligo during the 1980s, there was a wariness of the northerner, lest we might be carriers of the Troubles plague. North Sligo is known as Yeats country. The poet wrote to Lady Gregory in the run-up to partition in 1921. I have long been of the opinion that if such a disagreeable people shut the door, we should turn the key in the lock before they change their mind. The border was a deep wound. Murders that came to be regarded as shockingly normal in the village on the northern side would have been unthinkable half a mile away in the Republic. The peace process blurred the border, removed the furniture of huts and forts, dragon's teeth and craters, opened things up. The customs men vanished, the soldiers went home, no more checkpoints, red torches signalling you to stop in the darkness, no more furtive journey for smuggled sheep and chickens on unapproved roads. Nowadays they are brought on brisk legal journeys, all playing their allotted parts in global marketing systems. However, despite peace money, decades of economic neglect have left ruined towns and villages on both sides. There's no government in the north. Now with Brexit, old animosities are being rehearsed. Twitter is full of recriminations that seem to have had their day long before that medium was even invented. People in the Republic wince at the colloquial aggression coming from unionists, the Taoiseach told by a retired leader to wind his neck in threats of fish wars. They are irritated by Northern nationalists' insistence upon laws to establish 
cultural equality. Mullochamore is where in 1979 Lord Mountbatten and four other people were murdered by the IRA. A couple of years ago, when Prince Charles came here to visit, he was warmly welcomed, but on a sign put up to mark the visit, which featured a smiling photo of the royal couple, the face of Charles has re recently been gouged out. At a traditional music session in a Leitrim village last Friday night, the bloody ballad about the assassination by tenants of the cruel Lord Leitrim was sung. A woman said as she was leaving, wasn't it great to hear the song about old Mountbatten getting his comeuppance? The border has left an unhealed scar across the country that has begun with the Brexit business to open up again. So three years after I wrote that piece, we have a whole new set of border questions, not least the so-called border in the Irish Sea. And one of the issues I'm exploring in my book is the way that this border actually already exists, though it is denied. It is maintained by politicians who insist that Northern Ireland must be treated in exactly the same way as every other part of the United Kingdom. So here's a short extract from what I'm writing. Are you Imelda? This was the question that the woman wearing a red skirt might ask the anxious looking woman with an overnight bag as she came off a flight from Belfast into arrivals at any London airport. Or it might be the question a woman arriving from Ireland would ask the woman in the red skirt who seemed to be looking around for someone. Melda was abortion. This was the agreed code which allowed the Irish Women's Abortion Support Group to meet the women from both sides of the border in Ireland when they got to London to have their termination. And this is a quote. Often we would find it hard to hear a woman when she called us because she was whispering. She was probably calling from a phone in her family home or her workplace or a public pay phone and she didn't want anyone to hear, says Anne Rossiter, one of the members of the group. For many years when we were doing this work, there were no mobile phones and there was no internet. It's hard to convey to people now just how difficult this made things. It wasn't just negotiating the London Underground that could be daunting for women from Northern Ireland. During the conflict under the Prevention of Terrorism Act, extra scrutiny was applied to people coming in from Belfast. And then again a quote, under the Prevention of Terrorism Act, you were allowed to make one phone call and one Sunday morning I got called by a woman who'd been detained at Heathrow with her daughter who she was bringing over for an abortion, said Rossiter. I got myself over there and spoke to the police. We got it sorted out. The woman couldn't understand why the authorities hadn't grasped that she and her daughter were loyalists with a staunch British identity. I said to them, we're all paddies over here, Rossiter said. The network had links with Northern Ireland groups that supported women to travel, including raising funds to enable them to do so. We had difficulty raising funds in London, said Rossiter. It was partly because of the secrecy that surrounded the issue, but also the opposition of mainstream Irish organisations. Many of these were funded by the Irish government and heavily influenced by the Catholic Church. They refused to rent us our venues. Abortion was a morally explosive issue, she said. It was also, though, in another way, a unifying one. Annie Campbell, another of the group's members, is from a loyalist part of Belfast and came from a security force background, growing up with a strong sense of Britishness. For her, moving to London delivered some serious cultural shocks, as she explained in an interview quoted by Rossiter in her book, Ireland's Hidden Diaspora. Campbell quickly realised she was regarded as what she called a paddy, someone belonging to the lower rungs of the food chain. She found solidarity with Irish women from a Catholic background, women she would not have met back home. At first, she admitted she saw them as some sort of exotic species. However, it seemed to me that the reproductive rights issue brought us together and united us in a way that no other could, she said. The London Irish Women's Centre was founded in 1983 and became a congenial home for feminist groups. Rossiter is Irish and had not been in England for long when she had her own experience of crisis pregnancy back in 1963. She had a backstreet abortion that caused a massive hemorrhage. I was rushed to hospital and almost died, she said. The care I got was adequate, but the level of opprobrium was quite terrible. Most of the women in the group were from Irish and Northern Irish backgrounds. They knew such stories. They knew women who'd had to travel. They knew of women sleeping on their sister's floor in London because they were on the run from disgrace back home. Mostly on low incomes and living in rented flats themselves, the volunteers wanted to make the abortion journey less lonely and as comfortable as possible. People in England didn't understand that the North was part of the United Kingdom, said Rossiter. And once you explained that, it was even more confusing that women did not have the same rights there. 
When a survey Rossiter conducted for Mary Stopes and Voice for Choice was launched at Stormont in 2001, neither Sinn Féin nor the DUP accepted invitations to attend. A Sinn Féin MLA said that abortion was not an issue in Northern Ireland. And just as a footnote to that, uh, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson said during talks last year, 2019, aimed at restoring devolution, that for the DUP, abortion was a red line issue. Lisa O'Neill has a great border blues song that is about, among other things, smuggling wheelbarrows. You hear some older people reminiscing about smuggling butter across the border too, but there have been more disturbing undeclared passages across our frontier. Terrified individuals being taken away to be executed and disappeared by the IRA, bodies to be buried in some mountainy border bog. Pregnant women given a, given a diagnosis of fatal fetal abnormality had to go to England for late abortions and then had to smuggle back the remains of what they had dreamed would be their baby for discreet burial in Ireland. Over the centuries, many, many people from both sides of the Irish border have left this island because they were not allowed to flourish here or in many cases even survive. I remember the horror and sadness I felt when I read a news report about the death of a 16-year-old boy called Stephen Waring, who threw himself off the Liverpool to Belfast ferry and drowned in the Irish Sea one dark November night in 1977. Stephen had been sexually abused in Kinkora, the home, and perhaps also elsewhere when he was in state care as a child in Belfast. After he was moved to another facility, he confided in social services staff but it appears they did not help him. He ran away and fled to Liverpool. There he was soon arrested and put on the ferry. Terrified, it seems, of being returned to Concora, he chose instead to kill himself. I was at a funeral recently of a woman who also spent her childhood in what was with such in bitter incongruity known as care. I was part of the same circle of friends in Derry in the late 1980s as Claire, which is not her real name, and she was around the same age as me. We'd grown up within a few miles of each other. However, the circumstances of our upbringing could hardly have been more different. The closest I came to being subjected to violence in childhood was when my mother would threaten to take the dog's lead to me or actually deliver a whack from a wooden spoon. At school, I was regularly caned, all of which was regarded as perfectly normal way back then in Northern Ireland in the 1960s. Claire lived in another world. She had suffered extreme and unimaginable violence. She was brought up in Derry in one of the institutions which was investigated by the Historic Abuse Inquiry. The reason I've changed her name is because she gave her evidence anonymously. She'd been living abroad in a city that welcomed gay people as she was a proud lesbian and returned here to give evidence. It was, one of her friends said, a very isolating experience for her. It was also traumatic, not least because in order to show the injuries she had carried with her into adulthood, she had had to shave her head. Because a nun had battered uh, Claire around her head with a brick. I'll just do that sentence again. Because a nun had battered Claire around the head with a brick. She had been raped at the age of about six, and more than once she'd been hit so hard in the face that her nose was broken. Creative and full of life, she had survived with good instincts as to who she could and could not trust. She adopted good people in Derry and in other cities where she lived, other countries, to be her family. One of these people read an extract from Khalil Gibran at her funeral. Your joy is as your sorrow unmasked, and the self-same well from which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with your tears. And how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. It is not the cup that holds your wine. Sorry. Is not the cup that holds your wine the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? And is not the lute that soothes your spirit the very wood that was hollowed with knives? Claire loved music and dancing. One of her favourite songs was played at the funeral service, The Eagles' Last Resort, about a woman from Providence in the east of the US migrating west to try to find a place where she could be happy. Here's a couple of the, some of the words. She packed her hopes and dreams like a refugee, just as her father came across the sea. She heard about a place people were smiling. They spoke about the red man's way, how they loved the land, and they came from everywhere to the great divide, seeking a place to stand or a place to hide. So the woman ends up in a town called Paradise, and it turns out to be a hellish place, an ugly city built on land that was stolen and raped by white, white men. 
But if there was a darker side to that Eagles song, Claire also found fun in their music. The operations that her ill health required her to have meant she was given several full anaesthetics. When told to count to 10 backwards when going under, she would opt instead to sing Hotel California. Though she had people in her life who loved and cared for her, Claire died in a lonely town on the Irish border. As it happens, it was the town where uh, the arts centre was that I referred to earlier, where the woman talked about Mountbatten getting his comeuppance. Anyway, Claire was living there on her own, waiting to get compensation for the abuse she had suffered when she, when she sorry, let me do that again. Though she had people in her, in her life who loved and cared for her, Claire died in a lonely town on the Irish border, waiting to get her compensation for the abuse she had suffered when she could not choose those around her. It isn't clear what happened, but she had been complaining of the headaches recently that had afflicted her since receiving those childhood injuries. Cruelty got her in the end, it seems. Waiting can be a form of torture, to quote Roland Barth, to make someone wait, the constant prerogative of all power. Um, the author Dina Neri has written a wonderful book called The Ungrateful Refugee. And she says, a tortured mind, a terror of a wasted future is what enables you to abandon home. It's the prerequisite for stepping into a dinghy for braving militarized mountains. Many die in those attempts. Others are captured on borders and sent back to death or imprisonment. Those who get through often enter a limbo which in, in which they endure endless interrogations and grinding poverty. Refugees live in vast tented camps, in shacks, tents, metal boxes, abandoned institutions from other eras hastily reopened, like the old buttons, sorry, like the old butlins, mus sorry. Um, I'll start that whole sentence again. Those who get through often enter a limbo in which they endure endless interrogations and grinding poverty. Refugees around the world live in vast tented camps, in shacks, tents, metal boxes, abandoned institutions from other eras hastily reopened. Near where I live, there's the old Butlins holiday camp at Mosney in County Meath, which is now a direct provision centre. Nayeri describes people becoming slowly People so displaced, they can't even imagine the landscape of their future. And she quotes one asylum seeker, the future brings anxiety because you don't belong and you can't move forward. The past brings depression because you can't go home. Your memories fade and everything you know is gone. I'm standing on a thin border between past and future, waiting for madness to come. In Holland, she meets Ahmed Puri, known as a refugee whisperer, because he helps those seeking refuge to edit their actual life stories to make them more plausible. In other words, to present themselves the European way. My book, to conclude, is about borders. It is also therefore about human solidarity and it's about the barriers that we all have to remove to get to that. Thank you. <laughs>